Uh, so, many thanks for the invitation. It's a nice program. Um, so, I'm going to talk on uh, some work which is part of an ongoing project with Emmanuel Breuer. Um, so, let me start with this motivating question. Uh, if we take V, an irreducible algebraic set in C to the M, um, and take on each of the M coordinates, we take some finite um, subset, set of size N, subset of the complex numbers, uh, and then consider the number of points on the variety we get where we restrict to taking these particular chosen um, complex points on the coordinates. Uh, then it's not hard to see, basically by considering that generically you have a uh, projection with generically finite fibers to D of the coordinates, that if D is the dimension of the variety, then um, the asymptotics, this number of, of the size of this intersection, is a big O of n to the D. Um, so here's a question I want to consider. When is this exponent optimal? When is it not the case that you have a, have a bound of the form big O of n to the D minus epsilon for any positive epsilon? Okay, so just for the purposes of this talk, let's call such a variety special when D is optimal. Uh, so here's um, a simple example in the case of M equals 3. If you consider the graph of addition, so a variety x1 plus x2 equals x3, and take an arithmetic progression, take 0 up to n minus 1, then the number of points will uh, integers between 0 and n minus 1, such that the sum of the first two is the third, flows like n squared. Uh, so this is a case of something special. So now the elkesh sabo theorem, which we heard about earlier, um, can be seen as identifying what the special varieties are in the case of uh, working in C cubes and taking varieties of dimension 2. So... Um, so here's a, a statement, again, of uh, the theorem which Artyom mentioned earlier. Uh, and let me say immediately, uh, Artyom made a, a point of, of saying that you can um, get results where you don't just talk about polynomials, where you talk about structures other than algebraic because Hill's characteristic zero. But for this talk, I'm only going to talk about polynomials. Okay, Everything is in the complex numbers or an algebraic because Hill's characteristic zero. Uh, okay, so let me just read out the statement here. So, if you have a subvariety of C cubed, irreducible, dimension 2, then this exponent D is optimal, basically only in, the, uh, only in uh, situations like this case of the additive graph, the additive group I just presented, more or less. Um, so, more precisely, it's special if and only if either it comes from a one dimensional algebraic group, namely up to taking finite to finite correspondences on the coordinates. Um, v is the graph of a group operation of one-dimensional algebraic group over complex numbers. Okay, and here's exactly what I mean by that. You have this finite to finite algebraic correspondences, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. And if you think of them as finitely valued multifunctions, um, then you can say V is a component of the Zariski closure of this twisted form of the group operation, graph of the group operation. Um, or, trivial case, being a cylinder, we can say it as um, V projecting into the coordinates to a curve. Uh, so, really what I want to consider, at least in the first part of this talk, is what happens if you consider other, other values of M and D. And I'll uh, show how you can treat this model theoretically. Uh, now, let me mention a couple of remarks. One is... Um, you can get sharper results than this. So there's some work independently of Hong Wang and Raz Shireen Dezoev that uh, if two is not optimal in this Elkesh Zabo situation, if your variety is not special, then actually you get uh, a bound of the form n to the 11 over 6. So a big gap. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about this kind of precise um, quantitative business for the rest of the talk. I'm really going to just consider this question of whether D is optimal or not. Uh, and let me also mention that they, the same authors have a paper uh, where they consider the case of m equals 4 and co-dimension 1 uh, and again get a similar result. So. And also with some 
good bounds, a good gap. Uh, okay, so I want to consider this question um, in the following way. So, uh, so Hoshovsky's paper, his other one paper on pseudo-finite dimensions, um, provides a very useful calculus for handling this kind of question. So I'm going to uh, quickly introduce this um, as efficiently as I can, uh, and then explain how it's useful for this question. So here's the setup. Um, so I'm not making any claims. This is the best possible setup, but this works. So take u, a non-principal ultra filter on the natural numbers. And OK, for this slide, just take some sets, ks, and take the ultra product of them, of the ultra filter u, and then say a subset of the power of this ultra product k is internal if uh, it's given by taking an ultra product of subsets of each ks. Uh, and say it's pseudo finite if those are all finite. Um, and then we can define the non standard cardinality of a pseudo finite internal set X to be the ultra limit of the standard finite sizes of the X S's. So this is some non standard real number in the ultra power of R, the same ultra filter. Um, and then to have some scale to work with, let's fix a particular. So that's the limit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I use this notation, but you can use other notations. Uh, like psi naught to be the uh, to be some non-standard real, which is going to be a kind of uh, base. You happy? Which is going to be some base uh, number that we're going to scale things by. So make sure it's infinite. Okay, just some infinite bigger than any standard real. Uh, element of r to the u. And then we can define the course to finite dimension to be um, given by taking the log of this non-standard cardinality of x, dividing by log of the scaling psi naught, and taking the standard part, taking the standard real closest to it, um, which will so exist if it's not zero. So delta depends on psi naught. Delta depends on psi naught. So well, okay, so this can be uh, infinite. So you say R and R to zero, but you can Well, okay, no, no, no. So I, I took psi to be, um, to be, sorry, yes, yes, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, Yes, I should say union infinity. And union minus infinity, technically, because it could be empty. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yes, so I deleted that last night. Uh, yeah, okay, union infinity. Um, Okay, uh, here's just a, a way of writing this more explicitly in terms of big O notation. So um, we can say delta of x is less than C, a uh, standard real, plus the real, if and only if for some epsilon greater than zero and some Cessna ultra filter, um, so some large set. Uh, for S in that large set, we have uh, a bound of the form size of xs is less than or equal to our. Um, scaling psi naught s to the c minus epsilon. Okay, so c minus epsilon bound. Okay, and um, <coughs> basic properties which follow just from there being a log here is that uh, delta of a product is the sum of the deltas, and because we took psi naught to be infinite, uh, delta of a union will be the maximum of the deltas. Good. Uh, Okay, and now I want to introduce some structure. So, um, so I'm going to work with some countable uh, expansion of uh, the ring language. So, some langu countable language extending the ring language. And now let's assume our KSs, which on the previous slide were just some sets. Let's assume now they're expansions of the complex field to this language L. We won't have much control over these as structures. Uh, and now consider K, the ultra product, to be an ultra product as an L structure. So K is also an L structure. Um, and now, if you have a, a formula, phi, then the realizations, phi of K is internal. So we can take delta of it. 
So that's what I mean by delta phi. And if we have a partial type, then define delta of the partial type to be the infimum of delta of the formulae implied by partial type. And for the complete type, delta of A over C, take, okay, so just notation, delta of A over C is delta of the type of A over C. Yep? So how does delta make sense if it's not pseudo finite? Uh, I mean, okay, if, if this is almost always infinite, if this is almost always infinite, you mean? then it'll be infinity here. Delta will be infinity. Good. But, I mean, we've got an infimum here, so it doesn't matter if we have some infinite ones. Um, OK, here's one important technical point. Uh, to get good properties, we have to assume that delta is continuous, which is uh, something like definability of dimension. So well, here's a precise definition. So we want that given phi x, y, consider there's some family of definable sets as we vary y, and given some alpha in R, then for any epsilon positive, there's some definable y, so given by an L formula, uh, such that delta of phi x, comma b is less than or equal to alpha, implies that b is in y, which implies that delta of phi x, comma b is less than alpha plus epsilon. So some sandwiching. Um, OK, and maybe uh, in applications we're going to pick some structures and maybe we won't have continuity to start with but we can always enforce continuity by um, closing off under some cardinality comparison quantifiers without making the language be uncountable. Um, okay, I won't spell that out in any more detail but then with this uh, continuity property we have these useful properties of delta. One is that it's invariant, so in particular if A and B of the same type over C uh, in the full structure, in the L structure, then they have the same delta over C. Uh, and you have additivity, so delta of AB over C is delta of A over BC plus delta of B over C. Um, and uh, if you have a partial type, you can complete it without going down in delta. So a partial type phi over countable set C has a realization uh, and A uh, with the same delta, delta A over C equals delta of phi. Okay, so this is using aleph one saturation and countability of everything. Uh, and that delta going down is an ideal. Okay, now one more um, bit of setup. Uh, so, okay. We are working in an expansion of um, an algebraic closed field characteristic zero. This K will be an algebraic closed field characteristic zero in the setup, but some expansion of it. But we want to work with the, uh, the field structure, so just a couple of definitions. So fix some countable algebraic closed subfield of K, let's call it C naught. Assume that every point is named, which we can just do by naming them. Uh, and then define ACL naught to be uh, algebraic closure in the sense of the reduct to the algebraic closed field with parameters for C0. Okay, so explicitly ACL0 of a subset B is just the field theoretic algebraic closure of the field generated by B over C0. And then DIM0 is the corresponding dimension notion, the transcendence degree of C0 B over C0. Um, so note that if A is algebraic in the sense over B, then certainly delta of A over B is zero, because we have a formula of any finite many realizations, and C0 is in DCL set. Okay, now I want to explain how to cast the um, question I started with in these terms. So here's a definition adapted from Udi's paper. Uh, so say a subset of K is coherent if delta agrees with dimension on tuples from that subset. Okay. X is coherent if dim naught A is equal to delta of A for any A in the, any tuple A from the subset X. Uh, so what does this come down to really? Um, we can see it as being a kind of extremality condition in the case we're interested in. So if we have a finite tuple A from K, and assume that each element is itself coherent in the sense that delta of AI is 
uh, one assuming AI is transcendental and zero if it's algebraic, right? uh, then delta of the whole tuple can be at most the transcendence degree of A, the naught of A, by additivity. And uh, this finite tuple, considered as a set, is coherent, so meaning for every subset we have delta equals dimension, if and only if that happens for the whole tuple. Not hard to see. Okay, so some kind of extremality. <coughs> Maximal possible delta, given that each tuple have each of the elements have uh, the right delta. Okay, and then this notion of um, V being special corresponds to V having a coherent generic point. Um, so, more precisely, uh, if we have some V in C to the M, algebraic variety, over an algebraically closed subset C0 of complex numbers, then it's special, which means the dimension of V is the optimal exponent, uh, if and only if, for some um, ultra product of appropriate structures on expansions, uh, some appropriate expansions of the complex field, and an, an ultra product and some psi naught as above, then uh, we find a coherent point in the k points of V, which is generic over C naught in V, so the locus of A over C naught, which is just the Zariski closure in the C naught topology of the singleton A, is V. Uh, uh, as above, I mean on the previous slides, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, as here. So, KS is an expansion of C plus times. Okay. Uh, I was going to quickly um, go through an explanation of why this is true, not because it's interesting or deep, but just to clarify what I've been talking about so far. Uh, okay, so here's what's going on. So suppose that, I'm just going to do one direction. So suppose V is special, that means that the optimal exponent of these intersections is uh, D. Then uh, what that comes down to meaning when you just unwrap what this uh, means in the big O notation is that um, for each S greater than equal to 1, we can find some finite subset XIS of C, uh, well, 1 for each I, each of the possible I's from 1 to M. We can find such XIS, uh, each of size bigger than S, so unbounded size, uh, and such that then when we look at this intersection, it's bigger than XIS to the D minus 1 over S. Okay, this is just what you get from saying you don't have a better exponent that works always. So then we take an ultra product of these counterexamples. Yep. So take uh, XI to be the ultra product of the XISs and then just put in a, a predicate for that, for each I. So make this definable in our ultra product K by having a predicate which picks out this for each S and do that for each i. So xi is then a definable set for each i. Uh, and set xi naught to be the common non-standard cardinality of an xi. Then delta of v intersect the product of the xi, now working non-standardly, uh, will be d. Uh, OK, so then this is uh, a partial type. It's even definable. So we can find a realization with the same delta. And then that will be coherent and generic. Okay. okay. Um, so now, sorry. so so what have we won by casting it by, by, by uh, using all these definitions and rephrasing things in terms of points in our varieties? Is that then we can consider the uh, corresponding geometries, and this is. Key point, so let me, at the risk of boring people who know this very well, let me uh, quickly recall some basics on geometries, free geometries. Um, so, free geometry is just a closure operator on a set which satisfies exchange, meaning this, and, sus and has finite character. Uh, and then, to a free geometry, you can associate a geometry. Uh, so, a geometry is a free geometry where the closure of the empty set is empty and the closure of any point is just that point itself. Uh, so I'm going to use this notation, kind of projectivization of a pre-geometry S, 
is the geometry where you throw away the closure of the empty set and quotient by the equivalence relation of two points having the same closure. Uh, okay, and then part of the point of this is you have a good notion of dimension. So the dimension of a set A you can take to be the minimum of the cardinality of a uh, set which contains A in the closure. Uh, and then a key um, dividing line on geometries is modularity. So a geometry uh, is modular if whenever you have uh, a dependence between two points in the geometry, which is mediated by some other set of points, then actually there's a single point in that set, on the closure of that set, which is enough to witness the dependence. So if A and B and S and C are a subset of S, if we have that A is in the closure of B and C, but not already just in the closure of C, then there's a single element C of the geometry in the closure of big C, such that already A is in the closure of B and C. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so basic example of this is if we take a vector space over a division ring and take the projectivization in the usual sense, just a set of lines, uh, then this is a modular geometry. Projective geometries, modular geometries. Uh, and the other geometry we're going to care about is GK, which I'm going to define to be the uh, geometry associated to the pre-geometry of algebraic closure, field theoretic algebraic closure over C0 in our field K. Okay, so this is a geometry of algebraic closure of an algebraic closed field over an algebraic closed subfield. Um, so such geometry is certainly not modular. You can see this by considering the family of plane curves. Uh, so um, you really need C1 and C2 to witness this dependence between A and B. Uh, okay, so what's another point? I'm getting to it. So Huchowski observed uh, in a slightly different context that the kind of instance bounds which we've been hearing about um, imply some modularity. So this, in this context I'm presenting here, shows up very nicely. Uh, so for example, um, if we consider this basic uh, difficulty that gives you non-modularity of the full geometry of algebraic closure on K, uh, this does not show up if we restrict to coherent um, sets. So if we have X, Y, A, B, all in all non-algebraic over C0, uh, and Y equals AX plus B, then it can't be that this four-tuple is coherent. Um, why not? Because what would that mean? It would mean that delta of X, Y, A, B was three. That's the transcendence degree of X, Y, A, B. We've only got the single relation. But um, that contradicts some ready trotter. So there's a, a version of some ready trotter for C, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, so you get a bound actually of the form 3 minus a third, which is less than 3. So the corresponding delta will be less than 3. Yeah? Say again? Ah, uh, yeah, but you can't, I mean, however you do it, <laughs> you're going to fail. Yeah, uh, yes, it, it depends on all the setup with the, um, well, technically with the choice of what's definable. Uh, although it's not. So? There is, yeah, there's going to be no way to set things up as I did before to choose psi naught and uh, structure on K such that this is coherent. Good. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so that generalizes to give you a modular subgeometry of the geometry of algebraic closure. Uh, on K, that's the point. So, uh, okay, so this is the first bit you need. So, it turns out if you take a coherent subset of K, 
x and take what I'm going to call the coherent closure of x, which is just those points in the algebraic closure which are themselves coherent, just as singletons. So delta is 1 unless it's algebraic. Um, then this subset is also coherent. It's not particularly difficult to see. Uh, so now I want to consider coherent sets which are themselves already coherently closed. So take a coherent set and take the coherent closure and I'll be an example of such an X. Then um, using generalizations of some Eddie Trotter uh, of the kind we've been hearing about, um, in fact just in the planar case, what I'm talking about right now, uh, we can see that the geometry, uh, the subgeometry of GK that you get by restricting to this coherent set X is modular. It's a modular geometry. Okay. Um, so in a way, this is the main point. Uh, but we want to actually answer the original question. So um, that was the thing about when V is special, which means you have a coherent generic. Yes, what are the loci of coherent tuples? That's the question. What are the loci of coherent tuples? Um, okay, and then, well, okay, so by this proposition, that kind of comes down to understanding the modular subgeometries of um, GK, which luckily is understood. So, uh, okay, a couple of silly definitions. If you have a couple of geometries, then you can take the co-product, which is just the disjoint union of the geometries with no interaction. So the closure of a subset here, union of subset here, is just the closure of this subset, union of the closure of this subset. Uh, and if you have a geometry, you can take a subgeometry, which is just where you take a subset and take the closure to be the restriction of the closure. Then um, modular geometries in general uh, can be described as follows. So it's to find a non uh, an equivalence relation of non-orthogonality on a modular geometry. So if A and B are in S, say A and B are non-orthogonal, if A is in the closure of B with C for some C not equal to A. You've got a third point on the line through A and B, in other words. Uh, then this is an equivalence relation. Um, and the equivalence classes have no interaction, so the whole thing is a co-product of the subgeometries on the non-orthogonality classes. And we know by the quantization theorem of projective geometry that each class, each non-orthogonality class of dimension at least four, is a projective geometry uh, of a vector space over a division ring. And in the case that we're dealing with of a modular subgeometry of a uh, of, of the geometry of algebraic closure on an algebraic closed field, this um, <coughs> comes up in a particularly nice way. So this is a, an old result of Evans and Hushovsky from ninety one, which characterizes these projective subgeometries of the geometry of algebraic closure on an algebraic closed field. I'm going to state it just in characteristic zero because that's what we want. So um, Okay, so here's an example of how you can get such a modular subgeometry. So take G to be a one-dimensional algebraic group over C0 uh, and take some subfield of the ring of quasi-endomorphisms of G, so it's Q tensor the endomorphisms defined over C0 of G, uh, and then since uh, C0 is algebraic closed, C0 is algebraic closed, so G of C0 will contain the torsion if you look at the quotient of GK by GC0, this will actually be an FX space. So we can consider um, the projectivization of it. And in particular, if we take G1 of GN to be independent generics in G, so generic in the sense of the algebraic geometry, uh, then if we take the subspace, the sub F space of the quotient spanned by the GI, and projectivize that as an effect space, then that will be a projective geometry, which actually embeds, because these are independent generics, embeds as a subgeometry of 
the geometry of algebraic closure. Because there, there are no other relations on here apart from the linear ones. No other algebraic relations. Um, okay, and then Evan Trzewski showed that this is really the only possible example in the following sense. So if you take a projective subgeometry of uh, GK, of dimension at least three even, then it's of this form. In other words, it embeds as a closed subgeometry of this projectivization of GK mod GC naught, such that the embedding of G into GK factors via the obvious map here. Okay. So this explains what the modular subgeometries can be. Uh, let me say, I mean, so the, the, the key um, input to this is the group configuration theorem. So. Uh, okay, so then we can get some conclusions out of this. That's what I said so far. So, um, so let's consider our original question. We have a special V, then... Uh, okay, here's the answer. So if V is special, then up to finite finite correspondences on the coordinates, algebraic finite finite correspondences on the coordinates, um, V is a product of algebraic subgroups of powers of one dimensional algebraic groups. Okay. Um, good. So let me indicate why this basically follows from what we've said. So um, we want to understand what the locus of a coherent tuple looks like, these are the special varieties. So suppose A is coherent, um, and because I'm allowing us to take products here, uh, we can assume that it's actually a single non-orthogonality class, each pair uh, of AIs is non-orthogonal in this modular geometry of CCL of A, um, then we have two cases, either this is dimension one or it's dimension greater than one. Let's first consider the case that's dimension greater than one. Uh, so there's a slight technicality I said we can see as being projective geometries um, and in a nice way uh, once we have dimension at least uh, three in the evan suchowski theorem. Uh, but you can always, even if this is dimension two, you can bump it up to arbitrarily large dimension by um, considering independent realizations. So we can assume it's of large dimension. Uh, and then by Evan Sushovsky, this is uh, part of a modular subgeometry of GK, so it's coming from a one dimensional algebraic group. And then the uh, relations we have on this, the algebraic relations, correspond to linear relations on that group, on GK mod GC naught, F linear. Uh, so actually what we get, I'm writing it this way because I want to say something more general in a minute, it'd be the same idea. What we get is that the locus of, um, well sorry, we, we can replace the AI with some GI, which are uh, the points of G, which um, uh, which we had, uh, which are what we embed to here. It seems to be interalgebraic with the AI. Uh, and then the locus of G over C naught will be given by some linear equations, linear in the endomorphism ring of G. Okay, and any such thing as a subgroup of G, this is a subgroup of G, or G to the N rather. Uh, okay, and in the case, so this last bit is a technical point, in the case that this is of dimension one, um, this is the trivial case, you can still squeeze it into the same uh, setting by just taking your group to be GA, say, and considering just um, diagonals. <coughs> anyway, so, uh, so this, okay, this is the answer to my original question that I started with. Um, and as you see, it come down, came down to seeing that you really literally have a modular geometry, and then you know what these modular geometries are. So I want to talk now about, uh, unless there are any questions in this case, 
I want to move on to. Can you hold on by the yeah, go on. Of, by closure of points for the geometry. Uh, well, we were working over s over we we modded out by GC naught here, so um, yeah, and the closure of the empty set is all in here. If that's what you mean. Uh, well, sorry, rather zero in this vector space corresponds to G of C naught, which is the algebraic closure, which is the G points of the algebraic closure of the empty set. Uh, okay, so I want to move on to the higher dimensional case. So, uh, where was there a dimension one in what I've said so far? I called this the conclusion in dimension one. So the dimension one is that C is one dimensional. So, um, so it's interesting to consider uh, relaxing that and replacing C with some arbitrary dimensional algebraic variety, maybe multiple. So even the original Elikesh Sabo paper, the theorem, works in this higher dimensional context as well. So let me give this statement quickly. So, um, yeah, so now rather than taking V a subset of C cubed, take it to be a subset of the products W1, W2, W3, where everything is irreducible complex algebraic, uh, WI all of the same dimension, um, and let's say, uh, and V has dimension 2K, each of these is dimension K. Okay, so it's the same kind of situation. Uh, and now, okay, key point is that to get some uh, results of the same nice kind, it's necessary to assume that you work with finite subsets which are in general position. So take xi, finite subsets of wi, each of size at most n, and assume they're in general position, that xi is in general position in wi, which means that uh, xi doesn't, uh, yeah, if you think asymptotically, you've got these growing xi, and they don't accumulate on uh, proper subvarieties uh, of bounded degree. So, in other words, more precisely, that for any proper subvariety wi prime of wi, xi intersect wi prime is bounded by a constant which depends only on the degree of wi prime. Okay. Then, you get the same conclusion. They get the same conclusion, essentially. So, either... Um, two is not optimal, or V is in correspondence with an algebraic group, now with dimension K. Uh, and v, v is in correspondence on the coordinates with an algebraic group operation, with an algebraic group of dimension K, um, or some trivial case. Okay. Um, here's a little remark showing that it's important, really, that this fails if you just drop the general position assumption. Um, okay, so I want to explain now how to uh, deal with the corresponding generalization of what I was talking about earlier, my original question, uh, to this setting where we deal with higher dimensional varieties as the coordinates and we have some general position assumption. So it turns out the right general position assumption for this more general setting is, is not this original general position assumption. Is that not to work as nicely, but rather this weaker general position assumption, which I'll call coarse general position. So I'm stating it here non standardly. So if we have A in W of K, say that A is in coarse general position, if uh, for any B, if the algebraic dimension, the transcendence degree, drops when we add in B, so dim of A over B is less than dim of A, then delta drops to zero. So not necessarily that you just have finitely many realizations of the type of A over B, which would be general position, but uh, that you don't have too many. Uh, okay, in that sense. And then, and then to generalize um, what I was talking about before, basically what we want to do is, earlier uh, when I had a tuple A, the coordinates were just, um, Singletons, right? Now I want them to be elements of KEQ. So by KEQ, I mean algebraic uh, ACF KEQ. So we can see, think of it just as being uh, tuples of arbitrariety. Okay, the elements of KEQ are tuples of 
from k of arbitrarity. Um, and then here's the updated definition of coherence, this more general setting. Say a subset of kq is coherent if each element of x is in coarse general position in the sense and dimension agrees with delta. Transcendence degree agrees with delta for any tuple from x. Okay. Uh, and then again, you can define coherent closure in the same definition. And again, coherent closure of something coherent be coherent. And again, by uh, using now not just the planar case of these generalizations of some already trotter, but um, really uh, a more general version. Uh, we get again that if you take a coherent, coherently closed subset of KEQ, then if you uh, equip it with the restriction to X of algebraic closure, now in the EQ sense, then this is a modular <coughs> geometry. Okay, so now it's, it's not quite the same situation. Before we were dealing with just subsets of K, and K itself was a geometry. KEQ is not a geometry with algebraic closure. But nonetheless, we can find uh, subsets such that when we restrict to them, you get a modular geometry. Um, and then Evans Ryshovsky turns out to go through in this setting. So uh, here's a statement. So, OK, the statement is not as nice as the original, because I've said greater than 3 rather than greater than 2. I don't know what happens for 3, actually. That's a question. Uh, and this is really in characteristic zero. I assume it all works in positive characteristic, but anyway, here's a statement. So if we have a projective subgeometry, so I mean a, a, a subgeometry of K Q A C L E Q. Um, well, I mean projective subgeometry. It's really the geom the geometry of it is the geometry of a projective space. Uh, then again, there exists some abelian algebraic group G uh, and some division subring of Q tensor NC naught of G. Now, this is no longer a field, a skew field, but there will be skew subfields of it. Um, yeah, such that, again, G embeds as a closed subgeometry of the projectivization of GK mod GC naught, uh, such that this commutes. Um, OK, and proof is kind of analogous uh, using the abelian group configuration now rather than G group configuration. G is, G is, G is, G is uh, an algebraic group. No, but you assume that it's finite dimensional? G? Oh, oh, big G. Sorry, the geometry G. Uh, no, I don't. You get it somehow. Uh, why do I get it? I don't get it. This is not finite dimensional. No, no, no. This is the, the full GK mod GC naught. I think I've got a statement right there. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe I should emphasize this. I mean, uh, RTM mentioned earlier that um, the group configuration can be used to prove these other cache sub statements uh, in a direct way. This is kind of where it's hidden in this setup, right? There is still a group configuration going on. That's the ability group configuration, this high dimensional setting. Um, OK, so here's the uh, statement we get in this high dimensional setting. I've spelled it out maybe in too much detail, but um, so, so here's the, the generalization of the original question. So now we've got V. A sub variety of a product of varieties, everything irreducible, complex <coughs> algebraic, over some C naught containing C. Uh, and again, say V is special if it has a coherent generic, where coherent now means in the sense I just said, so including some general position assumption, this course general position assumption. Um, yeah, and OK, I've spelt out what this means combinatorially. I'm not going to read it out because, OK, it's some. Something like I showed in the Elkash Sabo statement, but with coarse general position rather than full general position, which is a weaker, weaker condition, so a stronger statement. Um, yeah. Then, if V is special, then up to finite to finite correspondences on the WI, 
uh, an optotating product again. V is an algebraic subgroup of the power of a k-dimensional commutative algebraic group G, where, moreover, we can say something about what this subgroup is because it's given as a connected component of the kernel of a matrix where the entries of the matrix are from a division subring of Q tensor and C0G. Um, what exactly is the difference between these two QFs? The, 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 the original one, all the WI were dimension one, or even they're all just C, as I stated it. So it's just a higher dimensional version with a more complicated statement, which is why I delayed it. Small k, small k what? Where do you see a small k? Small k, small k, small k. Where's small k? Where do you see small k? I don't see small k. K-dimensional. Oh, here? Oh, here you mean? Oh, k dimension. Okay, sorry. K is the dimension of WI. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> found it. Um, okay, that's actually all I wanted to say. Oh, I see. Um, well, uh, it, it means that every finite tuple is coherent. How strong is it? Well, um, uh, uh, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> the strong it is. Uh, I mean, okay. So the, the yeah, I, okay. In in the application here. What's interesting is a coherent finite tuple, but to handle that, you have to go to the coherent closure. That's where the modular geometry lives. And yeah, maybe I should say, I, the reason you have to do this is just because um, for modularity, we want to actually find points. But, uh, my definition of modularity was that there exists a C in the closure of C, and the point is that might not be in the finite tuple you started with. So you have to throw it in, and the magic is that when you throw it in, you don't lose coherence. Right? This is what's happening here. Um, you don't lose coherence. Uh, yeah, does, does that answer your question in a roundabout way? <laughs> okay. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I said, coarse general position is weaker than general position. Okay, so this so this is a, a special case for the dimension three case. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's the trivial case. Um, so da, 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 da. I had this trivial, yeah, this trivial case. It's dealt with there. That corresponds to the cylindrical case. Okay, it's 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 obscured with the the way I've written it. But if you consider the uh, diagonal. In, in GA squared, as a subgroup of GA squared, <laughs> it fits in. Okay. <laughs>